Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we, today we have Elliot Cutler, uh, independent candidate for governor. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. So the first question is, is uh, obviously there's a lot of talk in the run-up to this race about spoilers and Democratic candidates, but you've been t pushing a different sort of narrative, which is that, uh, that you potentially could gain some Republican support. I think that the conventional wisdom, part of the conventional wisdom in this race is that, is that Governor LePage is going to hold on to all his voters. And we've seen both polling evidence and anecdotal evidence, people coming up and talking to me who are Republicans who say we made a mistake and we're not going to make that mistake again. I think there's a huge opportunity in May, not just among Republicans, but among independents and Democrats also, who, who want to change and want to elect the best candidate between Congressman Michaud and me. And I think that's the right way for people to look at this race. They have a year to do it, and I think that they'll make the right judgments. This happened in 2010, this idea that there were potentially people who are partisans, registered members of the party that uh, would support you in the, in the ballot box, but not necessarily come out publicly. It would seem that that would help you if these people would come out publicly. This is the secret society? Yeah, well, we talk about the secret society a lot. <laughs> Clearly, in 2010, a lot of people voted for me who, who maybe didn't expect to at the beginning of the race, who other people didn't expect to ever. Um, and I, sus I expect there'll be some of that again. But I also think that the secret society is going to be a lot smaller this time. Uh, it's a very different race, different dynamics. I mean, don't those same people face repercussions from their party for supporting you? Well, those who supported me last time uh, publicly, uh, didn't. Uh, and secondly, you know, Steve, I, I mean, I think the, the, the hold that the political parties have on, on both legislators and the public generally at large uh, on voters is diminishing uh, month by month, I mean, week by week, day by day. And, and part of the reason is because people see what's been happening in Augusta and Washington and they say, wait a minute, you know, we don't want, we, we really don't need this. You got one endorsement late in 2010, uh, and there was some speculation that if that had do endorsement had come earlier, that that may you have mean helped the Portland you. Portland Press Herald. <laughs> no, <laughs> talking about it, obviously Senator Angus King, and that came three days before yeah. the election. If that had come earlier, there's some speculation that that would have pushed you over the edge, uh, pushed over the top, I should say. Will you get that endorsement this time? Well, that's up to Senator King. I mean, I I, I have great respect, affection for, for Angus. He, he did support me uh, in 2010. I hope very much that he'll support me this time. I chaired his campaign for the Senate. I think he's done a marvelous job in the U.S. Senate. Um, but, you know, people make their own judgments about, about when and whether to endorse. Uh, but I have every reason to hope, certainly, that he'll be in my corner. You uh, address education costs uh, a little bit in the book. Um, could you talk a little bit about your plan for reducing the per pupil costs, which I know that this governor has certainly tried to tackle, uh, Governor Baldacci did through district consolidation. What does your plan look like in terms of reducing per pupil costs? You know, Governor Baldacci uh, tried to do it by consolidation, uh, sort of a forced march to consolidation, by requiring consolidation without, without paying any attention to, to the needs of, of individual communities. Governor LePage has tried to achieve cost reductions by threat and bullying and cutting back on programs. I think what we need to do is step back and say, look, Maine needs a pre-K to 20 program. All of the states in America that are doing better with education and in some cases saving money as a part part of that, are taking a pre-K through 20 look at education in, at all levels. And they're investing in early childhood education so that kids who come into schools are finally ready to learn. My goal, as I said in, in the book, is by 2020, anybody leaving third grade in Maine knows how to read, is proficient in reading. That's not the case today. Uh, if we start rewarding good teachers and keeping good teachers in our schools, enabling them to do well, making, making the right decisions about consolidation by, by 
not by the stick, but by the carrot, so that we encourage consolidation where consolidation makes sense, and we reward uh, districts and people who, uh, school, uh, school districts and towns that decide to consolidate. We can bring our costs down. Didn't, the, excuse me just for a sec. Yeah. Didn't, didn't Governor Baldacci try the incentive approach prior to bringing out the stick? I don't think, it, I, not, 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 in a, not in an inventive way. He tried it in what I would call a voluntary way. But there weren't the kinds of rewards that I think we need to put in place. But there are a lot of other changes we need to make. We need to look at our whole system of, of financing public education in Maine. We're devolving, we're going right back to, to, to layering it on property taxes, which are regressive, which penalize people. We need to take a look at changing the way we finance public education. And we need to make post high school education available to all Maine students. We have a high graduation rate from high schools, relatively high. We have a very low matriculation and graduation rate from colleges. We need to change that because if you go to college, if you end up with a four-year degree, your income over your lifetime is going to be eight to ten times what it would be if you didn't. Of course, we've just went through a budget where um, a Democratic controlled legislature uh, attempted to salvage uh, education spending uh, while maintaining certain levels of funding at Department of Health and Human Services, and uh, also while, while Republicans were holding fast on th this tax cut package that they um, enacted two year, uh, 2011. Yep. What choices would you have made differently? Well, first of all, when, you know, our, one of the things that stands in our way, two of the things that stand in our way, number one is we don't have the economic activity we need in the state of Maine in order to generate tax revenues. Until we raise the level of economic activity, we're not going to be able to do the kinds of things we want to do in Maine. We well, need a plan to do that, and I've set out a plan. Secondly, our tax structure in Maine is unfair, not effective, not efficient, but one of the things I would have done differently is when, is when the so-called gang of 11, Dick Woodbury and four Republicans and four senators, uh, four Republicans, four Democrats, came forward with a tax reform plan. Well, unfortunately, the governor and the leaders of both political parties and legislature put their thumbs down on it, said DOA. Well, that was a starting point for discussing one of the biggest challenges we face in Maine, and that is reforming Maine's tax structure. And until we do that, we're not going to succeed. To go back to your first point, you're right. I've said over and over that there's no plan. There isn't a plan. Uh, I've published a book. It's a state of opportunity, a plan to make Maine, to build a healthier, stronger, smarter, uh, younger, more prosperous Maine. It's, it's, a, it's a plan. It's a vision, a plan, and a strategy. We need that in Maine. My plan may not be, in all respects, the best, but it's a starting point. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be here.